This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Today's guest believes justice is something that all Christians should be an advocate for. Stephron James travels the world empowering men and women to take on the cause of justice and how it's an essential part of our faith. Does, does justice always result in peace for the, uh, mm. the oppressed or peace in the mind and the heart of the oppressor? Does it always result in peace? I won't say it always re resolves into peace, but what I will say is it's the best chance of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the best chance of it because sometimes being just means disturbing things. That's why when Dr. King said, uh, non, non, um, very disciplined nonconformists are the best advocates for justice. They're disciplined, but they're nonconformists. They're not going to so take the party cannot, line. Yeah, you cannot bring the right to the world that needs to happen without justice having a voice. But justice will never be voiced through violence. And matter of fact, it says this. It says in um, Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3, it says, Seek the Lord, all you meek of the earth, who have upheld his justice. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Seek humility. And then it talks in um, Ze Zechariah chapter 7, verse 9. It says, Thus saith the Lord, execute true justice. Show compassion one to everyone to his brother. So if there is a true justice, then there has to be a false justice. Matter of okay. fact, you, you will find in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 18, it talks about them perverting justice. They they act like they're going to do that thing that's just, but this is how it says it when, in, when you get down to verse 19 and 20. It says, justice and only justice shall you follow, that you might live and inherit the land the Lord your God has given you. So what we have to be going about, um, let me give you one more scripture. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah chapter five, verse one, that says this, Run to and fro throughout the city. Look and take note. Search her squares to see if you can find a man, one man, one woman who is doing justice and seeks truth. And I will pardon the whole city. Sometimes wow. you have to begin to establish and settle this thing for God to come behind it and put his wind behind it. Yeah. So will peace come from justice? Ultimately, absolutely. And that's what Jesus said to the society, to the um, to the Pharisees. He said, War unto you Pharisees, you tithe, mint, and rue and deal, and you ne neglect justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done and not neglected the others. Let, let me end up here with throwing you a, you probably hit a good curveball, don't you? And let me let me let me throw one at well, you. Well let's see let's see how I do with it. <laughs> Uh, yes, we, we talk about social justice warriors again. And so you've got a whole group of people saying that it's it's justice for this young woman to decide what she's going to do with her body. So yes, we're, we're getting to abortion here. And we look yes, at sir. we look at abortion clinics centered in all of these poor neighborhoods and in, in uh, neighborhoods that might be traditionally uh, African-American neighborhoods. Does justice extend to the unborn or are we doing justice for this woman who's already got three kids and she can't have any more? Where's the justice? How do we how do we judge that justice and and what we support or what we we're proactive in in doing with that situation? I, you can't answer that question unless you go back to the original premise that justice is not a response. It's a foundational um, part of God's. Interwo that's interwoven into all of humanity. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. From the moment of conception, God said, I knew you before you were in your mother's womb. He said, I formed your days before you were even thought about in the lower parts of the earth. He said, you were established and I, uh, you look, look at um, second, uh, uh, Ephesians chapter two, uh, verse number 10, it says, you are my workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which I prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. So every child in the womb, when it is in the, when the egg and the sperm come together, that from that moment on is divine destiny from God. 
And because that is his divine destiny, to not give justice to that is to, to eliminate God's program and plan for a life that could be the answer for everything that we would ever need or want on the face of the earth. If I had been aborted, would justice come forth? I can't say, I don't know that it would in the way that, that God is allowing me to do it. So for the woman that is pregnant and she is deliberating of what to do with that child, there are plenty of people out there that would help with that. Um, I think it was in 2018, I think 2019 also. Um, and this is about Black Lives Matter. They matter to me. There were more children aborted in New York City in 2018 and 2019 than were born. If you wanted to create genocide for a culture, for a people, for a dark skinned people, can you go any further than abortion to call it out? I declare justice will come to our unborn babies. Justice will come to the mothers that need an answer. If there was a justice advocate there, there would be somebody that says, this is my place that I can supply to all these mothers. Give them what they need. God is looking to raise up individuals at this time. The part of justice I haven't talked about is that he will deliver wealth to the righteous so that they can do acts of justice for any that are oppressed, that any that are going through, any that are having a hard time. And we won't hold it against them because they got pregnant. We will be their advocate and we will bring them before God and say, God, let me be their answer. Let me be their help. You know, that's what Job said. He said, when they saw me, they applauded me. When they heard of me, they approved because I was there for the hurting. I was there for him that had a cause. I was there for the fatherless and the wick and, and the widow. I was there for anyone that needed my help. I was their answer. I put on righteousness like clothes and justice like a robe and turban. It was in my thinking. I didn't walk out of my house saying, what am I going to do today? I walk out of my house saying, God, how can I dispense your justice today? Show me my part. Let me be the one that's the answer. So I'm not telling you something, Bob, that's just a theory in a book. This is something I do every day of my life. I look for the opportunities to pour in other people. I look for opportunities to say, God, you, hey, here's the thing. There are, th there are four levels that we have to come to with justice. Number one, we have to understand it's an assignment. It's a mandate from God. Number two, we have to be prepared for justice. We have to learn what it is and how it works. Number three, we have to be equipped for justice. Equipping means that we take on what God says and begin to get prepared that when acts of justice, now let me, let me back up and just a little bit. If God brings Bob across my path and he has need and I am not prepared for that need, is that a God issue or is that a Stephron issue? Mm -hmm. That's a Stephron issue. I never put the things in place to be prepared to answer your need. So what God quickened me to do is uh, when I started studying this, I immediately, when I understood it, started putting money away that God, this is your money for acts of justice. If our justice need comes up, I don't even have to go pray about it. I know when it hits me that you have ordained that for me to do. And I can supply to that need. When COVID started, God specifically spoke to me that there were couples families and churches in Africa. And this is what he told me. He said, you are to sustain them through this whole season. Guess what that meant? <laughs> I had to make sure money was there when they call. So when they call, I don't even respond. I just go to my, um, my app that sends the money and send it. That's the preparation. The last step after you go through the mandate, you accept the assignment, you go through the preparation, you get equipped, then there's the divine wealth released to you because God can bring money to you, but he can also bring it through you. It doesn't stick to you. <laughs> if you know it's designed for him. You and that's the problem with the prosperity ministry. If you look at 2 Corinthians 9, 8, it says that our God is able to make all grace abound towards us, that we having all sufficiency in all things at all times might abound to what? 
every good work. He has told you, O oh man, what is good <laughs> and what does the Lord require? God has ordained us for good work. He created, we are his workmanship, created for good works. But if we're not ready to do the good works, then God can't trust us with his wealth. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just, but only when they're just. Wow. So <laughs> once he releases his wealth to us, then we can start seeing nations change individuals. Look, we, Bob, we can't change the world for everyone, but we can change it for one. Mm -hmm. Amen. We can make the difference for one. And I have just determined whoever God brings across my back, path, I can trust him to do it. Um, first Timothy chapter six, verse 17. We talk about God saying the, um, the love of money is the root of all evil. Just seven verses later in verse 17 of, of first Timothy chapter six, it says this. It says that God uh, to the rich of this world, I say, I charge you not to be haughty and not to set your hope on uncertain riches, but to set your hope on God who richly gives us everything to enjoy and he said this he said be ready to distribute be ready to give ready for every good work every good work when i read that i said god never again do i not want to be ready when you call me but that's where people won't people won't prepare i next if we ever get to talk again <laughs> i'll tell you about my new hero of the bible zach a man named zacchaeus <laughs> okay <laughs> The man that Jesus Called left down. the whole entourage yeah. to spend the afternoon with him. And the scripture says he was rich. Hmm. Hmm. What is up with that? <laughs> We're going to find out. We're going to get you back, man. Thank you so much. Again, the book is uh, uh, Champions of Justice. You've gotten that broken out into, what, four smaller books as well. Yeah. So we have The Cause of Justice, Streets of Justice, the way of justice and paths of justice. justice. We call it justice light. But be ready, the <laughs> next ones are coming. We got justice heavy coming. Okay. Uh, we have stand yeah, we have standards of justice, um, kings of justice, thrones of justice, ordinance of justice, and Zion, God's dwelling place of justice. Wow. What any idea when those books are coming out? in the next year uh, as soon as soon as i can find a little bit of time in my schedule to finish them up <laughs> well i got four of them i got four of them written and i'm working on the fifth one wow it'll be okay. just as ever but they are they 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 it's where god just showed me things i've never imagined even after i had been studying this for years wow. and the web a website a good uh, address for people to get in touch with you or with your uh, work the way of justice dot us the way of justice dot us yes sir steph Ron, thank you so much it's been a joy yes, being sir. with you today and we're going to get you back all right man i enjoyed it too thank you so much after the break cancel culture has become one of the leading threats to evangelical christians greg steyer founded the organization dare to share and he believes while cancel culture remains a threat it can also be a great motivator for us to share the gospel with others. That's coming up next on Viewpoint. Would you like to help expand the reach of Viewpoint with Bob Placey? Then sign in with your YouTube account and subscribe. Do the same on your favorite podcast app. By subscribing, rating, and sharing Viewpoint content, you will help this life-changing media show up on more search engines as popular and trending. If everyone watching right now would do that, Viewpoint would become more visible worldwide to online viewers in places that missionaries can't even reach. Thank you for helping us reach the world by sharing Viewpoint with Bob Placey. Cancel culture has become one of the leading threats to evangelical Christians. Greg Steyer founded the organization Dare to Share, and he believes while cancel culture remains a threat, it can also be a great motivator for us to share the gospel with others. That ministry, how did that, uh, did that come out of your time at, at Yankees Church? Did it come out of your time afterwards? Were you educated to do this, or this is something that came just through the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, both. I mean, I think, uh, you know, Yankee just believes so much in teenagers. Mm -hmm. And I saw that growing up, the, the power of the gospel and the potential of young people. 
Uh, teens come to Christ faster and can spread the gospel farther than adults. And uh, so that was in my DNA. And that the Holy Spirit definitely put it in my heart to start Dare to Share. And so we started Dare to Share in 91 and, um, you know, doing small little events and trainings. And, you know, since then, we've been able to train millions of teenagers across America and now around the world how to share the gospel. If you look at uh, George Barna, we interviewed him last year. And George was saying, you know, there's, there's less teenagers in church. They're not coming back. It's not that circle where they, they go to Sunday school, leave when they're in college and come back after they get mm -hmm. married. That circle's not being completed now. Less and less teenagers in church. Uh, are, is it, what have you seen in that, in that 30 some years? Are churches less focused on teens or has the culture, are we, we, we culturally inept compared to the rest of the culture? Well, I mean, it's a, Barna calls this the first post-Christian generation in the mm -hmm. history of the United States, Generation Z, this current generation yeah. of teenagers. And, you know, I, I think they're just, the, the stuff that we did in the 80s isn't working. The come and see, you know, come mm -hmm. to our big, cool youth group. It's just not working like it like it was back then. So, I, and I'm not anti-come and see, but we have to combine come and see with go and get, go and tell. So, mm -hmm. what we're finding is the youth groups that are thriving are missional. They're focused on the Great Commission as the greatest cause. Mm -hmm. And uh, matter of fact, a dare to share, we don't call it the Great Commission. We call it the cause. It's the great cause of Christ to go and make disciples. And what, what I find is when teens view the gospel as the greatest cause, then they get excited. Then they come to youth group. Then they want to grow and they want to go and reach their campuses yeah. and friends. And so uh, I think if we really want to get them to grow, we got to get them to go. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what Dare to Share does. We train, equip, and mobilize teenagers and youth leaders how to build a go mentality and to carry it out. Yeah, one of the things you hear is that uh, you see a lot of teenagers, the people are saying that there's no hope, uh, there's no purpose. Uh, they're looking at iPads or, or whatever they're looking at uh, to get on the internet, and they're living vicariously through some social influencer and uh, mm -hmm. they're living lives of isolation, not lives of purpose. Uh, how do you how do you break through all that? And 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 uh, I mean, with Dare to Share, you're, you're not a youth group; you're a ministry to youth groups. Uh, yeah. how, how do you break through all that and 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 get them energized? So, <clears throat> Kara Powell, Dr. Kara Powell, came out with a book called uh, "It's Like the Three Biggest uh, Questions a Teenager Asks." And it's identity, belonging, and purpose. So, you mm -hmm. know, identity, who am I belonging? Where do I belong? Purpose, why am I here? Well, the gospel answers the question to all that. Identity, you're a child of God. Mm -hmm. You've been adopted into the family of God. Belonging, you're part of a family, a family of God. Yeah. And purpose, go and make disciples. And uh, so I think we need to reposition Christianity from a meeting to a mission, you know. And the gospel is not just a ticket to heaven. It's yeah. it's it's also a ticket to knowing who you are. As you're talking to youth leaders, what are their biggest obstacle obstacles to uh, to bridging that gap? First of all, to a teenager and yeah. getting that teenager to say, "Yeah, I believe that." I mean, how do they emphasize with a teenager when? And in your case, you're 56 years old. How do you emphasize with yeah. a teenager who's facing uh, issues that you never faced as a as a young person? Yeah. Well, they. I, I would say. Every teen, we, they struggle with the same kind, basic kinds of things that we struggle with when we were teens. But social media exasperates all that, just yeah. accelerates all that, you know. And you know, it, it's it's a bigger struggle because it's everywhere, and they can't get away from it. Um, so what do you, what do you do? You have a bigger offense. You got you got to play the best defense is a good offense, right? And I think we need to go hard at at really showing how the gospel uh, solves identity, belonging, and purpose. And we need to give these kids mis missionized, and they heal along the way. So mm -hmm. I had one girl at a – we do a summer camp called Lead the Cause. It's like a student leader camp. And she came to me. She goes, you know, every camp I go to is all about me, my hurts, my needs. She goes, this is the first one where, yeah, you talk a little bit about that, but you really talk about Christ and the cause. And she goes, you know, keep lo looking up to who Jesus is and looking out to that mission. In the process, I feel like I've been healed. Wow. And so I really think the transformation comes when we take our eyes off ourselves and look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We fix our eyes on him, and then we look at the fields that are ripe for harvest. Mm -hmm. And in the process, our hearts are transformed. And so I think we need a new mentality in youth ministry. We need to 
we need to totally rebuild youth ministry. Um, and how do we do that? We go back to the book of Acts. It's a radical new paradigm that's 2,000 years old. It's mobilizing our kids for the gospel. It's it's pouring into making disciples who make disciples. And you can have fun and games along the way and, you know, do camp and all the great stuff, you know, play dodgeball. All that's great. But we got to make room for what matters. And what matters is the mission, not entertaining kids, yeah. but mobilizing them. Then they'll come back to youth group because they got a purpose and a mission and belonging and identity. Yeah. Is there is their greatest fear when they when they uh, when you see the light go on in their in their head? Is their greatest fear been what do my friends think? Am I going to get canceled? Am I going to look like a fool on on social media? Oh, yeah. uh, what's their greatest fear to to make that that light click on in their brain in their heart? Yeah, all that and, and the, yeah, I mean all that stuff. I mean you. You give a kid a choice between going to the Amazon and building a mud hut for the poor <laughs> while fighting off pythons or going to their school cafeteria, the public school cafeteria, and sharing Christ with a group of their friends. They'll choose the pythons because mm -hmm. they'd rather literally get risk getting choked by a real python than getting choked out of their social circle. So that is a huge fear. But when kids bridge that gap and do that, what, what, they re what it does is it deepens their faith because they're scared to death. It makes them mm -hmm. dependent on the Holy Spirit. They see that usually their friends don't all reject them. Some of them are very open. Matter of fact, I think teenagers today are more open than ever to talk about spiritual stuff. And when they get to lead of one of those friends of Christ, it's a game changer. Yeah. It is a game changer. So I think, hey, we face those fears and we lean in. To, we have somebody inside of us called the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. right? Now, I want to give you something to think about, Bob. Jesus was a youth leader. So <laughs> yeah. if, let me let me make let me make my case. Matthew 17, 24 through 27, Peter and Jesus and the disciples go into Capernaum, but only Peter and Jesus pay the temple tax. Yeah. If you cross from that with Exodus chapter 30, verse 14, the temple tax was only for those 20 years old and older. So all the disciples are there, but only Peter and Jesus pay. If I'm reading that right, he was a Jesus was a youth leader with one adult sponsor, <laughs> one rotten kid named Judas, and no budget. And with that youth group, he changed the world. Yeah. Now, we have an advantage over Jesus. That sounds heretical. But in our youth ministry strategy, his disciples at the time didn't have the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Our students yeah. that have put their faith in Christ do. The Holy Spirit was with the early disciples, but not in them. Not in them. And from Acts 2 on, they, it was he was in them. Right. So we can change the world, shake our cities with a youth group of 12 just like Jesus. What what are your tools? What how are you how are you reaching them? How are you reaching youth leaders? And uh, yep. what what's what's the, the the tactical side of that? So two two main things. We have uh, catalytic events. So uh, every November we do Dare to Share Live, which is a free seven hour training on a Saturday where students are inspired, equipped, and mobilized to share the gospel. It's fun. Uh, it's interactive, but with last November, we had 1,300 churches participate across the nation, urban, suburban, rural, uh, Southern Baptist to Pentecostal, you know, and it's a free event. Uh, we also have a uh, Life in Six Words app that's free on the App Store that it's in 12 different languages. If you can swipe and read, you can share the gospel. And we, as of now, we have about 75 pieces of free curriculum on our website, daretoshare.org. And I... I encourage parents, grandparents, youth leaders, anybody that's associated with a teenager is a youth leader, a leader of youth. Mm -hmm. Go to dare to share the number two, dare to share.org. Download this free curriculum. Take your teens through it. Mobilize them with the gospel. Go to the app store. Download life in six words. Go to dare to share live.org. Be a part. Yeah, you got to teach them how, how to evangelize. Exactly. So the illustration I use, if I take a sponge with milk, and I pour the milk in that sponge and I don't wring it out, it rots. Uh, it spoils. We have a lot of discipleship strategies just pouring milk. Mm -hmm. And what happens if we don't wring that out to others through evangelism and discipleship, we rot. And I think our whole strategy for discipleship is two believers that have been saved for 20 years, meeting every week for an hour to remind themselves of stuff they should already know and should already be doing. That's not biblical discipleship. Biblical discipleship is we make disciples that make disciples. make disciples. We get the word in, and we get we put the pour the word out. Yeah. What kind of what kind of reports are you getting back from the field now? I mean, and oh man, thirty years. I mean, what what are you seeing? What are you seeing as results? 
we're seeing I, revival in pockets. I mean, we really are. Mm -hmm. I, we want it to be a sweeping revival. Um, but we're starting to really see teenagers unleash. I mean, just this last weekend in Mobile, I mean, literally teens running up to me, engaging the gospel with their friends, kids that have just put their faith in Christ, sharing the gospel for the first time that day. They trusted Christ the night before or sharing Christ the next day with their friends. Students in co gospel conversations, I mean, adult youth leaders getting convicted that they're not sharing Christ with their own neighbors and friends. I mean, you get this in the middle. What, you read the book of Acts. What happens? The Holy Spirit in Acts 2, how does he appear? He appears on a, as a tongue mm -hmm. on fire, which is a really weird on way fire, to yeah. appear. But he sets their tongues on fire with the gospel. I think we get twisted mm -hmm. around that passage and we missed the point. The first sign of the indwelling Holy Spirit is our tongues are set on fire for Jesus Christ. What what continues to give you not only hope that it's going to change, but the 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 knowing that it's going to change and the joy of seeing it change. Well I I think this generation is ready, ready for a mission and ready for a vision. I think the gospel is good news. So we have to explain it as good news. And I think once they're called nuns, N-O-N-E-S. Mm -hmm. They don't have any religion. Once they hear the real gospel, the yeah. truth that God loves them, he cares about them, sin screwed mm -hmm. everything up, religion doesn't work and closing the gap, but Jesus paid the price mm -hmm. on the cross because he loves them that much and that he rose from the dead. It's good news. And, you know, all you have to do is put your faith in him. Like my mom with that cigarette, you know, you mean all, all, all I got to do is trust him. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and, and then Jesus does that work of transformation in their souls. So I'm very hopeful. Very hopeful. Very hopeful. Okay, you're talking to a, a lot of teenagers that are going to go out and evangelize. What, what kind of mistakes do you see them? I mean, they, they got enthusiasm. They've got uh, oh, yeah. youth on their side. Uh, you, you see them making any rookie mistakes out there? Oh yeah, well, one rookie mistake is they sometimes they bring it up too quick. It's hot in here. It's hot in hell too. Let me tell you about Jesus. You know, and they'll just <laughs> enthusiasm. Like, oh, come down. <laughs> yeah, they're excited. The other is this mentality that oh, I'll just live the gospel out. Um, you know, there's that old quote: "Preach the gospel if necessary, use words." I hate that quote. Yeah. Uh, I change it to "Preach the gospel. It's necessary, use words." Use words. And of course, we want to live it but we also got to give it. So I think that balance between rel relentless and relational, you know, uh, we got to help teenagers find, but that's our job as, as adults and, and, you know, parents and grandparents and youth leaders, we coach them, we help mm -hmm. them. As Greg said, God does his best work against a dark background. It's our hope that Viewpoint encourages you to have the faith and knowledge to live an authentic life for Christ. As we do each week, I remind you that this show and the ministries of TV44 are supported by viewers just like you. So we'd appreciate your financial support. I'm Bob Placey, thanks for joining me. For more interviews on demand, plus additional resources from today's guests, go to WTLW.com and click on the Viewpoint tab. If you are enjoying Viewpoint, we would appreciate your financial gift so we can continue to produce more programs.